So we have some guests here tonight, and I'll ask Adam to come up and uh, read them off and uh, welcome them. So I'm just going to run through some uh, guests for tonight. So we've got uh, Sharif Gatman from Total HVAC, uh, Jenny Chu from Environment Canada, uh, Dave Titus from Train, Henry Delavari from Applied Energy, Emily Cormier from JP2G, and Ashley Lance from BRM. So thank you guys for attending, and thank you everyone who sponsored a student tonight. As you guys know, for the uh, every other meeting that we've had so far this year, we've been able to raffle off some tickets. Uh, what we're doing today, given the uh, unfortunate near end of the senator season, uh, we have some red and blacks. Yeah. It's okay to be realistic. It's been a great run, and I'm as much a Suns fan as anybody. Do anybody. that. Be that as it may. Uh, we are edging towards football season, and Walmart has been generous enough to donate two tickets for a Red Blacks game, I believe, in July against the Stampeders. So it uh, should be a good contest. The seats are excellent. Giorgio Mari is wandering about trying to sell some tickets, and he tells me that you're being a little stingy this month. So feel free to uh, get, catch his eye. He'll come over. It's, you can't get a better deal than the $20 ticket deal. So uh, George will hook you up, and it really goes a long way towards helping our research promotion goal. George has done a fabulous job this year so far. He'll tell you more about it himself in a few minutes. But uh, we're edging closer and closer to the goal. It'd be great uh, to get your help tonight to help us meet that. Um, next, I'll ask Adam Moons to come up and uh, tell us about some new members. Thank you, Steve. Uh, four new members to announce this month. Mr. Andrew Duncan. Mr. Daniel Hefner, Mr. Raymond Bolter, and Mr. Scott Lewis. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask Andrew Duma to come up. Uh, he is the person who's organizing our annual um, match player uh, scramble golf tournament, and he'll give you more of the details. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the Ashrick Golf Tournament is scheduled for a Tuesday, June the 16th at the uh, Marshes Golf Club, the same golf club as we, uh, we played at last year. Uh, we currently have, uh, I guess, foursomes reserved for those who participated last year, so I'm still waiting for uh, everybody to get back to me then, or from last year. I'll be holding that for a couple more weeks, and we are currently uh, extending a list for, uh, for a waiting list. So if you are looking to put a foursome in this year, by all means, please get a hold of me. Uh, cost is $700, and uh, we're also looking for sponsorships for this year. So a sponsorship goes for about uh, $200 and includes a uh, sign in the course with uh, proceeds going to uh, Ashray Research. So hopefully we see everybody there on uh, Tuesday, June the 16th for the uh, Ashray Golf Tournament. Thanks, Andrew. So yeah, just to reiterate, uh, if you want to get in the tournament uh, with another foursome or a first foursome you weren't there last year, it is going to be a first come, first serve for the waiting list. So. Uh, usually there's a little bit of turnover, but not an awful lot, so uh, try and get in touch with Andrew soon if that's uh, on your radar. Uh, every month we have a theme uh, associated with the meeting. This month's theme is research promotion. Like I mentioned, George Mawari is our research promotion chair, and he's been doing yeoman's work getting the money raised, and he's uh, got some uh, updates for us, so he won't take long, but uh, George will give us the update. Thanks, Steve. All right, so uh, Ashray Research, today is the uh, theme for the night. Um, our campaign so far has been very, very good. We're off to a good start. And I want to thank my RP committee chairs, or co-chairs, Christine Kemp, Kathy Godang, Steve Moons, Don Weeks, uh, Bob Kilpatrick, Mike Swain, and Patrick St. Ange which have done a phenomenal job to help us raise the funds. Our objective is 25,000, we're almost there. Uh, we're close to about uh, 21,000. We're still working with some of the major donors that uh, still haven't gotten that check yet, so we can't really count on that yet, but we're, uh, we're hoping for it. Um, you know, 
there's a lot of, you know, I put this slide up, uh, this PowerPoint presentation up, there's a lot of, of benefits um, that goes towards RP for our membership. Um, if it wasn't for RP, you wouldn't have the standards, you wouldn't have the handbooks, uh, you wouldn't have the ALI courses that uh, Ashri offers, you wouldn't have the webinars. So all these funds that we collect are given back to our membership um, in many forms. So if you haven't contributed yet, please take the time. If you haven't received a phone call, you should be getting uh, one in the next uh, couple of weeks. So please have your checks ready, your credit card, and uh, hopefully you can donate. Thanks a lot. Great, right, thanks for your The Colin campaign that George mentions uh, is something that uh, the Research Promotion Committee is doing and have done in years past. And where we start with that is we get a list from Ashray Society that lists the people who have donated uh, last year and then the years previous. But if you're new to the industry, uh, your name may not be on the list. And don't just wait for a call. And I, I realize that I'm literally just begging you for money. But at the same time, like George says, it goes to an important place in the industry. And everybody here makes their living in one way or another from our industry. And part of keeping that successful and keeping it going and being uh, promoting the arts and sciences of uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is helping research promotion. So uh, George mentioned the members that are on the committee. Feel free to approach anybody. Give me a call directly and I can direct you where you need to go. Donations don't need to be large. There's no minimum. But uh, consider what you can do uh, to, to help us out and, and keep things going in the industry. Uh, next item of business, uh, there is a webinar coming up on Thursday, and I'll ask Dan Redmond to come up and give us a little bit more information. Thank you. So, as George mentioned, uh, some of the RP money goes towards giving back to the members, and one of those mechanisms is through webinars. This Thursday, Society is putting on a webinar, uh, Existing Building Commissioning. The Ottawa Valley Chapter is hosting it, and will be presenting it in the HTS boardroom. We do still have some seats open. It's open to, we have 18 seats total, and right now we have 14 people registered. So if you are interested, please sign up. It's on the regular chapter sign up page. If you want to attend and you find that it is full, please send me an email and uh, we'll see that you can get connected. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next, we uh, in this past month, uh, one of the items that uh, our local chapter does is support a student a student science fair every year, and uh, our student affairs committee chair was attending with a few other people from the chapter. So I asked Adrian McKenney to come up and uh, tell us a little bit more about that. So last month we went to the it's the regional. Ottawa Science Fair, and it was me, Richard Cameron, and uh, Jason Bursell, who is also here from the Carleton, uh, the Carleton Ashray chapter. And uh, we went around, talked to a lot of different students through different projects, and we gave out three awards of $200. Uh, one that was uh, for a project on a green wall and how to do it uh, economically and actually without drainage, which was an inter interesting project. Uh, there was another project on the Bernoulli effect, and basically just doing a experiment to show how the Bernoulli effect works and all of that. And there was another one on the environmental effects, environmental factors influencing academic performance, where she looked at how indoor air quality can affect your performance uh, in academics. Uh, so it was all, it was a really great fair. There were a lot of people there who uh, were doing really great science projects. And uh, these were the words we gave that were actually related. Thanks, Adrian. So, uh, in the last month, we had opened up nominations for uh, governor positions on the board and also the executive position. Um, I'd ask uh, Bob Kilpatrick to come up now and uh, discuss how they are progressing and give us more information on that. Uh, thanks, Steve, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, so tonight, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you a proposed slate for the executive and board for our chapter for uh, the upcoming year. So for president, we have George Mamari. For president-elect, we have Abby Saunders. For treasurer, we have Adam Graham. 
And for uh, the secretary position, we have Dan Redmond. And our proposed slate for the Board of Governors is uh, Richard Cameron, who's uh, kindly agreed to come back for another term, along with Aaron Dobson, who has agreed to the same thing, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Frawley and Chris Fudge also returning, and new to the Board of Governors this year is Adam Moons. So at this point, um, I would ask if there are any final nominations from the floor or from the membership in general. And if there aren't, I would ask <coughs> someone to make a motion to close nominations for the year. If I could do that. Kathy, thank you. And if I could get a second here. Somebody, anybody? Don, thank you very much, Don. So with that, um, that will be the slate that will uh, be installed at the main meeting and that will guide our chapter in, uh, in, in the, uh, the near future, in the upcoming year. So uh, thanks to all those who agreed to take on the position and thank you to the uh, nominating committee for their help and, uh, and discussions that we've held over the last uh, few weeks. Thank you very much and see you next month. I'll just reiterate Bob's thanks on that. Um, the positions that are being filled are by people who are eminently qualified to do it and have been involved in that trade for a really long time. So uh, it's fitting that they're being moved in those roles, but also uh, a, um, a task of taking on willingly something that's going to take up a fair amount of their time. That said, volunteerism in ASHRAE doesn't need to be a massive commitment. Uh, we are looking to fill roles on various committees, and the roles can be very simple, not very time consuming. It's a good way to get your foot in the door, learn about what ASHRAE is as a society, and uh, establish some network connections. So if you've ever thought about volunteering at ASHRAE, then please feel free to get in touch with Bob or myself. And there are some people who we've had our eye on that we'll probably be getting in touch with, in touch with directly as well. So. Uh, Try to keep an open mind if somebody asks you to, to give a little bit of your time for the coming year. The next item of business, uh, we have Mark Lawrence in town. He's our RBC of membership. Um, so most of our committees have uh, RBCs, which is a regional position uh, that looks after all 11 chapters within our region. Rob's in from uh, uh, out east, so I'll ask him, or Mark's in from out east, so I'll ask him to come up and uh, say a couple words. Yes, my name is Mark Lawrence, and uh, I'm from Halifax, the Halifax chapter. And uh, so I'm part, uh, I come from one of nine chapters which is in our region. And so for those of you who are maybe new to the organization, or the larger organization with the ASHRAE, all the chapters in Eastern Canada roll up to a region, and then of course the region rolls up into uh, the society. And so overall, there's over 53,000 ASHRAE members of which you are part of your 53,000. So my role is to uh, represent, I, I, I have two roles, as a, as a RBC, a Regional Vice Chair for Membership Promotion. I take your issues that you have for membership and I bring them to society to represent our region. So your chapter and the other nine chapters in this area, take them to society. So um, on, your, on your membership things, you can talk to Adam or anybody else on your team. Adam will feed to me and I'll go up to society and uh, bring your, your uh, issues forward. The other thing too is I'm here to support you and you and your membership. So if you if you need support on uh, what are the benefits of, Ma of ASHRAE or uh, anything related to membership, I'm here to support you and support that. Uh, region 2 is also really special because we actually have many people in our region who are uh, involved on a society level. And I just want to take a quick second is Somebody who uh, I've spent a little bit of time with is David Underwood. David's one of our uh, vice presidents of ASHRAE. David is always, every time I've seen him speak, has always said uh, with sincerity, uh, he's always said thank you to people sitting here. So I wanted to say thank you to you guys, uh, as part of us, all together as just as an ASHRAE family, for coming out here tonight. You guys have a great crowd here. 
And if you didn't come out, then your chapter wouldn't be successful, ASHRAE wouldn't be successful, and then we wouldn't have the ability to have all the technical support that we have, the networking abilities that we have. So just by coming out, uh, you, are, you are supporting your chapter. So thank you for that. Think about giving back to the society, whether you're involved. We just had nominations, and uh, Steve said, you know, even a little bit of voluntary time is helpful. So by doing a little bit of voluntary time, coming out to the, uh, to the regions, we, as a grassroots society, can kind of be successful. So thank you for coming out. Thanks for having me. Um, you guys are a wonderful chapter here, and um, I just love coming to Ottawa. I used to live here a while ago. It was great, so I'm kind of having fun coming back here. So thank you. Uh, the last thing that we will get to before we break for dinner would be to review the tabletops for tonight. Uh, first, I would ask uh, Jeremy Strong to come up with a train company and talk about Advantix. So as Steve just mentioned, uh, we're here to represent uh, Advantix. They're a liquid, a liquid desiccant um, machine. So basically what we're doing is taking upon the standard principle that salt has an affinity for water. So salt solution in water wants to take moisture out of the air and grow. And whereas if you have warm water on its own, it wants to uh, evaporate. So basically taking that standard principle, putting it into a, a unit with minimal mechanical cooling and uh, creating an energy uh, efficient and sustainable way to uh, dehumidify with hopefully less CFM, less tonnage, and uh, a little bit of energy recovery. So some ability for some lead opportunities and uh, some opportunities to decrease horsepower and decrease tonnage in your building. Thanks, Jeremy. And uh, the second tabletop is TWA, represented by Total HVAC. And I'll ask Andrew Duma to come up. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, today we're presenting TWA panel systems, uh, manufacturers out of uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, radiant heating, radiant cooling uh, panel systems, as well as uh, chill beams, which you'll hear a little bit more about, uh, about tonight. Um, certainly stop by, come see some of the flexibility we have with, uh, with radiant heating and cooling systems and how they can be applied to practically any type of building, and uh, talk about the chilled beans and how they can help you uh, you and your owners save energy. Thanks. Thanks I do encourage all of you to uh, pop by the tabletops. Um, it's one of the uh, places that we're able to generate a little bit of revenue, and the local suppliers are generous enough to come here, uh, give us some money, which helps us out, keep our costs down. But more than that, it's an opportunity for you to learn about new products. Um, there's some, uh, as much as the, the pace of the growth of our uh, technology may be slow, there are new items coming out and part of the role of suppliers is to help you guys learn about it, but you have to be uh, a little bit proactive. So take advantage of the guys. Uh, it's interesting stuff. It helps you gain a better depth of knowledge and be able to help your customers more. So also, we'll be here uh, after dinner. So uh, feel free to drop by. So that will uh, adjourn until after dinner. Thank you. Seven of that. Thanks, so. All right. Okay. There's a winning ticket. Seven nine three nine seven nine. Nine seven nine. Theoretically, somebody has won. Mike Swain, ladies and gentlemen. Mike Swain. Active chilled beams. Darren Alexander with uh, Twa Panel Systems in Edmonton. Thank 
participate in your local last rate chapter. Uh, obviously, an important organization. And it's great to see this level of commitment to, uh, and support. <coughs> so uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, active beams in particular, um, and why it is that these uh, equipment, or that this equipment is considered, and uh, where it's uh, trending, if you would. Um, Fundamentally, a uh, chilled beam, is, or an active beam, as it's more correctly uh, referred to, is uh, an induction device. And uh, this is a cross-section of a unit in terms of uh, what they would look like and how they're assembled, generally. Uh, it's inclusive of a, a duct connection and, of course, a, a plenum. Uh, and then the, uh, they're generally made out of sheet metal, although they can be uh, fabricated out of other materials. There's a cooling coil in it. And uh, effectively, we're talking about decoupled ventilation systems. So we're managing the sensible loads in the space separately from the ventilation requirements of the uh, of the occupied zone. And the way these work is essentially the primary air, which is uh, processed separately from the uh, the room air, is uh, pressurizing the plenum at uh, B. And uh, the plenum pressures that you might expect to see in that. Uh, uh, Pressurized plenum is between, say, three tenths of an inch to an inch of static pressure, uh, 70, 75 pascals to uh, 250 roughly for those of you the preferred uh, metric. Uh, the pressurized plenum then converts uh, static pressure to a, a jet or a nozzle uh, here at the sheet metal boundary between the plenum and the mixing chamber and causes a low pressure zone at the root of the nozzle. And that low pressure zone uh, helps to draw air in from the space that's uh, rising through convective currents uh, to pass across this coil uh, at D that's held above the dew point of the space and mixes in ratios in this mixing chamber uh, here at E uh, in ratios as, as little as 2 to 1 and as high as 6 to 1. Uh, the higher the mixing ratio obviously the more effect we see uh, for the amount of heat that's extracted from the space at the coil um, but uh, fundamentally those nozzles are chosen uh, to suit the air delivery that's required to offset the latent loads in the space. Uh, the coil is held above the dew point of the space and uh, is typically fed with chilled water, of course. And uh, uh, combining the two air streams at E and discharging into the space uh, at F. So I've got a little bit of a, a video or a little bit of an animation to kind of show this process in terms of how uh, the air streams mix. The primary air <coughs> supply temperature is not so critical in terms of its uh, dry bulb temperature because of the mixing that happens within the chamber. But uh, in this case, it's 57 degrees. The room air rises through natural convection into the coil, which draws the heat uh, from the space and uh, uh, is delivered to the space at temperatures that are roughly half of what you would expect to see in an all air solution in a straight off coil condition. Uh, that might uh, look something like 55 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Again here we see that the coil is uh, again held above the dew point uh, to ensure that we don't condense and that's uh, one of the, the primal rules I guess of, uh, of active beams in terms of how they're applied. Uh, But the, uh, the effective uh, philosophy or the strategy of a decoupled ventilation system is to replace the capacity that will be delivered in an all air system, and in this case it's uh, uh, depicted with an 18 by 18 inch uh, air duct with a uh, primary air duct sized for the minimum ventilation or uh, the minimum primary air, in this case 7 inch uh, diameter round duct, and a 1 half inch uh, water line given that uh, water has 3,400 times the heat carrying capacity of air. Uh, the goal in this strategy of the decoupled ventilation is fundamentally 
to reduce the total air consumed at the primary air handling unit, uh, which translates into direct energy savings. This is a graph that uh, shows principally where the energy is being saved, and obviously reducing the total airflow in the building envelope will reduce the total energy consumed at the fan. <coughs> And uh, an active beam is a fully mixed system. There's no radiant effect associated with uh, an active beam. The air is uh, mixed in the space very thoroughly. Ventilation effectiveness of an active beam in cooling is typically unit. So uh, a VE of one for, uh, for beams in cooling. And can be also true in, for beams in heating. Uh, but there's some restrictions in terms of the application of beams in overhead heating to ensure that we get proper uh, throw and drop in the space. Uh, this is a beam that's turned on its back so that we can see the, uh, the internal components. This is a two-way discharge beam. Oftentimes beams are placed into a T-bar ceiling grid. Um, and for uh, the incremental cost of the installation, uh, we yield more capacity out of a two-foot wide beam generally than we would see with a one-foot wide beam. Uh, although they're available for aesthetics as well. Uh, here's the coil, a cutaway of the coil for the doors which generally integrate to create the, uh, the linear slot diffuser. So the beam, uh, once the air leaves the beam, or as it leaves the beam, it uh, effectively operates as a linear slot diffuser. And so the discharge uh, slot here uh, follows all the same rules and, and uh, methods of distribution, or sorry, distributing air to the space as we're accustomed to when we uh, consider it to act as a linear slot diffuser. So on some decoupled ventilation systems, we've seen them before, uh, fan coils that are operated dry, where we're introducing the minimum primary air, uh, would fundamentally use the same uh, design principles relative to offsetting the latent loads in the space. Uh, variable air volume systems, obviously, as well, can be uh, created a more efficient uh, air delivery system by uh, uh, modulating the airflow. And then the VRF and FCUs, or fan coil units, are effectively the same, except for the uh, operating fluid, one beam, chilled water, one beam, uh, <coughs> down fluid, refrigerant. But the, the minimum primary air that we need to supply to the active beams is governed by the greatest of the following three elements. Uh, the minimum ventilation that's required by code in terms of ASHRAE standard 62. The air that we need to offset the laden loads in the space is the second element. And that's really governed by the design decisions of the, of the design consultant relative to how dry or uh, dehumidified the primary air can uh, be, uh, sorry, how dry we can make the primary air relative to the evaporator coil. And there are energy consequences, obviously, and capital costs to make that primary air drier. Uh, and then uh, the other side of the equation in terms of how much mass flow or primary air that's needed to offset the latent load in the space is how humid we allow the space to be uh, designed to. Um, and the difference, the separation between the dew point of the primary air and the dew point of the room design condition fundamentally drive our mass flow rate that's required for the second element and that's, uh, that is the one of which to uh, denote the space. The third is the volume of air that we need to introduce to the beam itself to create induction. And uh, a case where uh, you may find that uh, you can meet the minimum ventilation with no problem in terms of the psychometric load analysis and remove 100% of the latent load may be a transitional space in a corridor near uh, some exterior glazing. Uh, don't have a lot of requirement for the dehumidification. Uh, it, there's very minimal ventilation load, but there's a tremendous sensible load. And so it's quite uh, appropriate or it's an, a space that could be considered uh, a very uh, suitable space for an active beam given that uh, if our goal is to minimize the primary air that's consumed uh, with the proper selection we could see a beam in that space that could yield uh, one ton of sensible cooling or 12,000 BTUs of sensible cooling for as little as 100 CFM of primary air and that would be considered a very efficient uh, air side delivery system for delivering uh, one ton of sensible cooling or 12,000 BTUs. And the greatest of these sets are minimum primary air. And the, the simplest way and the, the uh, 
the most accurate way to determine whether or not a beam is appropriate for a space is to run the psychometrics on the locales. So we look at uh, the actual data that's mined from the uh, low calculations to determine whether or not a beam is appropriate for that space. And all beams are not appropriate uh, for every space. There are instances where we'll find that the latent load drives our primary air to too high of a volume that uh, detracts from its use or that we're so close to being able to manage the sensible load given the design conditions that we chose on the primary air dew point or the room design condition to uh, negate its effectiveness. And uh, fundamentally, we let the psychometrics of the load calcs guide us to determine whether or not a beam is, uh, is right for the space. So again, uh, our design conditions or the criteria upon which we uh, use to gauge whether or not a beam is suitable for the space uh, may also be coupled to uh, the design strategy for other spaces in the building. And where a beam isn't necessarily appropriate for every room, uh, perhaps we've coupled the beams to a displacement ventilation solution in a large open atrium where uh, potentially a beam isn't the most appropriate or the best uh, choice for the space given that we need to have the discharge air drop to the bottom of the occupied zone and at the warmer discharge air temperatures that we see on an active beam and conceivably the higher convective currents that might exist in a zone like that, uh, the displacement ventilation could be a, a good solution, or maybe a chilled slab and displacement ventilation. Uh, in any event, uh, the supply air temperature is less critical to the performance of the beam uh, from the cooling perspective, although we do take account for the uh, supply air as a, a principal contribution to the uh, to the sensible cooling uh, that's governed by the equations that we use for that. Uh, but the net goal of reducing the air handling unit and the duct size is achieved through simply this very rigorous accounting of the loads in the space. And we'll see in some of the zones that offices conceivably could be a very appropriate uh, <coughs> option or opportunity for an active beam given that uh, the latent load is modest uh, the occupants because of the occupancy of course and uh, the sensible load could be moderate to reasonably high uh, classrooms where our latent loads are becoming more significant or more relevant to the to the space in terms of vetting uh, the issue as to whether or not a beam is appropriate for the space uh, all the way up to say like a lobby uh, for the conditions that we described earlier whereby they just might not be the right solution and that's okay So again, the goal of our three air, uh, sorry, our three selection criteria on our primary air is to remove the uh, moisture from the primary air in the unit, sorry, from the primary air at the uh, air handling unit. Uh, but that's our only means of dehumidifying the space. And if we uh, if we do anything wrong in terms of designing uh, active beam systems, uh, that's our opportunity for mischief. Is effectively we must check the psychometrics in each of these spaces and ensure that our design criteria and there are reasons as to why we would allow the primary air to be driven lower, obviously, to uh, get closer to the minimum ventilation uh, or volume that we would need to supply at the space, but that uh, there's an energy cost to that, and uh, the equipment also can become expensive to really dry out the primary air. But car the cardinal rule of beam design, obviously, is that the space dew point uh, must be below the entering water temperature to prevent condensation on the coil. These are some sample operating conditions that you might see in an active beam solution. Um, again, there's a range of dry bulb temperatures that exist because of the mixing that exists within the beam body, and it becomes less critical to the performance of the beam, but it is a contribution uh, that is to the space that allows us to deduct it from the total sensible load that uh, the beam would need to be selected to to achieve that cooling. Uh, some sample uh, dew point temperatures that we might see off of the primary air handling unit are summarized here and uh, some conditions that we might consider for the space. And it's remarkable, but uh, there's been, uh, I mean, it's pretty easy to see on a psychometric chart that a lowering of the relative humidity in the space from as little as 55% as is presented in this case to say 50% could translate into an increase in primary air uh, consumed by the occupied zone to as much as 30 to 40%, uh, which is significant, obviously. Uh, beams aren't a silver bullet, and they're not for every space, and they do have limitations, one of which is 
uh, overhead air distribution in heating mode. And so when we discharge from the beam, it's important and critical to check the supplier temperature at the discharge of the beam to the space to ensure that we get appropriate pattern or good uh, flow and uh, mixing in the space. And so generally that would restrict us to a uh, supplier temperature <coughs> greater than uh, about 15 degrees Fahrenheit above the set point of the room. And so if the room was designed for winter heating at 70 degrees, generally we would restrict the discharge air to 85. Uh, to ensure that that room air was mixed properly, thoroughly, and heated the space without preventing a thermal climb. Uh, at the bottom here are the equations that are generally used to help solve for the minimum uh, mass flow or minimum primary air that's required in the space. Uh, once we've determined the latent loads uh, for the equation on the left, we can solve for the CFM to the room to ensure that if that CFM is smaller than the minimum ventilation, then the minimum ventilation becomes the uh, determinant factor in the mass flow to that space. If it's larger, it means that the minimum ventilation is not uh, adequate to offset the latent load, and we can either change the design conditions in the space, if that's uh, an option available to us, or uh, lower the primary air dew point, if that's also affordable and uh, reasonable to do so. The contribution that we expect from the sensible cooling of the primary air is solved for in this equation uh, and we would simply deduct that from the sensible load peak of the space and select the chill beam uh, pursuant to that resultant total sensible load uh, with the primary air conditions uh, relative to the space design temperature here as the temperature difference. When we talk about the control of the latent, we also have to look at any infiltration loads or other latent uh, sources that could exist in the space. And this becomes quite critical because that needs to be added to our uh, latent load calculation when solving for the CFM of primary air at the conditions that we have uh, delivered to the room to ensure that we offset uh, the latent loads in the space, of course. And then for maxim maximum occupancy, and generally the guideline is such that if it's a borderline space for an active beam, it's uh, generally safer to err on the side of caution and consider that space to potentially be treated with all air or some other solution, uh, rather than uh, have a space that could uh, uh, lose dew point. Obviously, there'll be controls in place uh, to ensure that we either lock out the supply water to the beam to prevent condensation, or if it's a more elaborate system, conceivably there could be an opportunity for a chill water reset uh, for a larger zone in the event that we lose dew point. Uh, ultimately, if we can't recapture dew point on the change of the space, uh, say that for instance there's an open window or uh, some other uh, introduction of latent loads, we would need to lock out the uh, chill water supply to that space. And VAV for fluctuating occupancy is a, is a bit of a misnomer. The problem with beams, again a weakness, is that uh, the response profile of, this, of the beam itself is not linear to the, uh, to, to the pressure that's in the beam. And so ultimately what you'll find is that if we try to use a VAV box for modulating control, we'll see that it uh, effectively becomes a, an occupancy valve, a two position occupancy valve, because the turn down ratio is very, very limited. Uh, by using a VAV for modulating the flow control into the beam, which you can do, uh, but the, uh, the effectiveness or the cost effectiveness is that, of that is, is generally uh, of, of little benefit. So beam placement and uh, orientation within the space becomes uh, the next talking point because there, it's not a difficult piece of equipment to install in the space relative to the air distribution. Again, it's treated like a linear slot diffuser. Uh, the most critical point obviously becomes P3 where the two colliding air streams uh, combine and uh, can create a draft in the occupied zone. Uh, obviously down here at P2 where the air is discharged down the sidewall is less, less of a risk factor as it's uh, uh, technically outside of the occupied zone by ASHRAE definitions, but uh, still a concern and still something that should be checked. Uh, essentially the L2 dimension or the placement of the discharge of the beam can also be a talking point relative to controlling the glazing surface temperatures. And so in the event that we discover that uh, much of the load comes from the glass and we can mine this information from the psychometric uh, calculations, I'm sorry, the low calcs, uh, we may choose to bias the discharge of the beam 
closer to the glazing in, in order to ensure that we are managing the glazing surface temperature adequately, uh, preventing uh, radiant asymmetric uh, uh, comfort issues. And so this is, a, this is a bit of a graph that is meant to show how we can move the air in the space at a comfortable velocity. And if we were to look or compare, and this is a, a very old Barbara Coleman chart, if I'm allowed to, uh, to use a trade name, uh, in any event, if we were to design the space to a 72 degree Fahrenheit temperature and we were to measure the air at that location um, after the <coughs> diffusers had been placed per the uh, manufacturer's recommendations, we would generally see a fluctuation in the temperature at that observed position of nearly two degrees Fahrenheit. And as a consequence of that, the manufacturer in this particular case is suggesting that that would create a draft effect on the occupant, uh, which is a problem, of course, and limit our average room air velocity to somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 feet per minute. However, under the design condition of an active beam solution, where we're designing the space to a warmer temperature uh, to begin with, and uh, as a con also as a consequence of the fact that the primary air is mixed vigorously within the body before it's discharged to the space, that same uh, position whereby we're measuring the temperature variations in the space would net a supply temperature or an observed temperature of less than one degree Fahrenheit of temperature variation suggests that we could conceivably push the airstream or the average room air velocity to as high as 70 to 80 feet per minute. Now, ASHRAE standard 55 says that we cannot do this, but the concept is carried through such that it is less risk of draft to have a warmer airstream distributed in the space, and the high churn ratio, or the high induction ratio more correctly, uh, that passes through the beam, the lower the risk there is, of course, of, uh, of creating draft. <coughs> Ultimately, the beams have come as an evolution to an existing design. Uh, an active beam is, uh, is effectively an induction unit. Uh, it's used a little differently from its uh, uh, conception or its uh, inception of uh, perimeter induction units. Uh, in any event, um, so the higher the pressure that we have available to us at the beam, the greater the capacity and generally doubling the plenum static pressure uh, could conceivably yield as much as 70% increase in capacity, which translates into obviously uh, reduced capital expenditure because the uh, beams can become smaller as a result. Uh, at the end of the day, the beam, or the active beam, is effectively a sheet metal box with a coil in it. And how we apply the beam in the space to solve the sensible loads is really the art uh, in terms of understanding how it will integrate to the other systems, how it will distribute in the space, how it will control uh, other surfaces in the space to create a, a comfortable environment and uh, one that is uh, appropriately designed. Um, the weakness or the pitfall of designing an active beam system to the minimum plenum static pressure is that we have no uh, low side for churn in the space. So the lower limit of the plenum static pressure to the beam is really uh, governed by our ability to create a uh, pattern in the space. So to create coanda or throw and drop into the space, generally beams will bottom out in the neighborhood of about three tenths of an inch. And so if uh, our system design is uh, set up or arranged around all beams that are scheduled for say three tenths of an inch, give or take, uh, we now have no opportunity to be able to lower the capacity in that space in the event that the loads change or the space sees churn. And so oftentimes we'll advocate for plenum static pressures that are uh, somewhere more in the, uh, the middle of the range. The other benefit to that strategy is, is frankly, uh, the primary air handling unit must be designed to overcome the static pressure of the distribution ductwork, and uh, as a consequence, the pressure is available to us. And so having that uh, delivered to the beam, uh, and coupled to the fact that it delivers more total capacity and lowers the capital cost of the equipment, is, uh, is a useful uh, approach. Uh, in addition, because of the plenum static pressure that we have to generate at the primary air handling unit, if we were to design all of the beams in the spaces at lower plenum static pressure, we now have to introduce a, uh, an obstruction in the ductwork to scrub off some of the pressure before it's delivered to the zone, and uh, that has the, the potential to generate noise. And so flow-generated noise becomes a talking point 
uh, relative to high pressure changes between the distribution duct and the beams themselves. Uh, the velocity of the duct nozzle is in the neighborhood of six to 7,000 feet per minute, uh, which is a, a brisk pace in uh, most air uh, discussions. However, the nozzles are very small, and generally the industry has gravitated towards a, uh, a bell mouth shaped nozzle uh, profile. And so that smooth transition between the static pressure that exists in the plenum and the, the cohesive jet, which is the goal of the nozzle design, uh, is, is a more uh, gradual transition, so there's less turbulence and lower opportunity for noise, given that each of those sound sources are also very tiny, even though they add logarithmically, the, uh, the acoustic signature or the sound in the space is generally not driven by the beam itself. It may be flow-generated noise uh, because of large pressure drops uh, or other equipment in the space. Oftentimes, it's very easy to design an active beam job to an NC criteria that uh, is, uh, by most standards, considered to be quite aggressive. Uh, but the general rule follows or tracks that larger nozzles uh, make more noise, and higher pressure also generates more noise. <coughs> we can't uh, modulate the capacity, again, uh, uh, on static pressure, because the, the response of the beam in terms of thermal performance isn't linear. But if we take the square root of that, we're now into a, a linear control zone. And again, we could conceivably control the beam on modulating control with a VAB damper. However, the, the modulation range is short or small. Uh, we would need to select the beam at a much higher static pressure to begin with to uh, ensure greater turndown. But uh, ultimately, the usefulness of VAB or uh, occupancy valves uh, come into play when we look at uh, the risk of overcooling a space. So earlier when we talked about the percentage of primary air that's delivered to the space that can be used as a credit to uh, reduce the total sensible cooling in, in the room, uh, that plays against us in a more highly occupied space because the volume of air is now closer to delivering the total cooling capacity. And without a load, uh, if that is representative of 50% of the total cooling effect of the space, uh, we're going to overcool the room. And so a two position or an occupancy valve uh, makes a lot of sense, uh, although it creates some, some other issues relative to balancing our plenum static pressure upstream for the other beams in the array. Uh, there's means to address that. And they're, uh, they're generally this first element in the far left-hand corner. So these are known as pressure-independent flow regulating dampers. Uh, they're installed directly in the duct, and they react dynamically with changes in pressure of the duct system to distribute air into the space in the neighborhood of uh, 5 to 10 percent accuracy, for some reason that neighborhood. Uh, failing that, a uh, more traditional approach for a constant volume system might include an iris damper. And the reason that these have a benefit is that they're very accurate. Generally, the duct distribution and the duct velocities that service uh, active chill beams are in the sub uh, 600 feet per minute range at the runout to the beam itself. Uh, the duct design upstream of the runouts uh, are per your. Uh, typical design criteria. But generally, excuse me, we want to limit the duct velocity into the beam to ensure that uh, we're not creating flow generators across the nozzle plate. And in general, that runs about 600 feet per minute. Uh, but these are very accurate. And so we will simply measure the plenum static pressure across this adjustable orifice plate and net a uh, mass flow rate into the zone for balancing that's in the 10%, uh, 10 to 12% range uh, for accuracy. Pedo traverses uh, generally, as a general rule, for active beam systems don't work uh, because the duct velocity is too low to support uh, the proper measurement technique of integrating that profile in order to uh, determine the mass flow into the space. Uh, so these are, are generally preferred. They're a little more expensive, but they're much easier to establish a branch flow than, say, a butterfly valve, which is, uh, has two surfaces for which the, they can trip the flow and create noise and uh, they're very sensitive to their positioning in order to be able to set the downstream static pressure. Uh, the top damper is very similar to the iris damper. Uh, its design is such that the blades are uh, angled in the direction of flow to get better static regain and create less flow generated noise as a consequence of this tripping surface at the, uh, at the iris. And then uh, this other device is a spring calibrated pressure independent uh, butterfly style. So there's an inflatable uh, uh, element behind the blade to uh, position the, the mass flow of air that we need uh, 
conceptually, these are very similarly priced, uh, pressure independent, uh, flow regulating device and an iris damper, very similar in price. Uh, pressure independent butterfly type with that spring calibrated is in the neighborhood of three times uh, the expense. And uh, these are somewhere in the middle of that. So we talk about the psychometrics obviously for cooling and the preliminary design may be based on a DOAS system but nine times out of ten you'll find that the primary air that's going to be delivered to the beams because of the reasons that we discussed earlier in terms of uh, uh, equipment cost or capital cost to uh, reach a lower dew point of the primary air and uh, uh, equipment cost, sorry, uh, capital cost for the equipment and uh, the fact that uh, there's an energy consequence to that uh, generally would drive us to the point where the primary air will be somewhere in the neighborhood for a typical office building of maybe 20 to 30 percent higher than the min vent, uh, which is, uh, it seems like a lot, but it's, uh, it's frankly not when we compare it against a, uh, a rough rule of thumb on a conventional, say, all air system, and, and this isn't a slight against all air systems. If we were to consider that at 400 CFM per ton, even a slight increase in the primary air to offset the latent loads, uh, with good beam design, we could conceivably see in the neighborhood of uh, two to even 300 CFM per ton at the most. And beyond, beyond that, uh, maybe an active beam for that particular space may not be a good solution. So the goal is to put the bulk of the cooling onto the cooling coil, as much of it as we can. Uh, the primary air is there, obviously, to offset our latent loads and be our main vent. Uh, we look at the water flow rates, and in general, uh, we're driven by minimum flow rate to uh, achieve uh, turbulent flow, uh, so a Reynolds number of 4,000 or so, uh, which on a half-inch tube is about 0.65 GPM, give or take. And on the upside, uh, the maximum water pressure drop that's allowable to the system, uh, which generally is 10 feet, uh, although as a design engineer, you may prefer to have less than that. And on an eight-foot coil, with two and a half GPM, we'll be in the seven to seven and a half foot uh, uh, water column pressure drop for that coil. Uh, and there's options on coils in terms of being able to circuit them as a, either as a single serpentine or, or, or headered, and then the entering water temperature. And your entering water temperature again is governed by your psychometric calculations that you do at the beginning to ensure that we're above the dew point. And on that note, uh, it is possible to run the chilled water at the dew point of the space, but it's not recommended. Uh, generally, a good rule of thumb is to have the chill water at least one degree Fahrenheit warmer than the dew point of the space. Um, the warmer the water we make, the greater the safety factor there is, obviously. But it also has a consequence in the fact that we have to provide more beam, which drives up the capital cost in terms of being able to cool that space. Uh, but as a general rule, it's much cheaper to circulate water in the space than it is to supply air. And if, uh, if we agree to the fact that uh, roughly 42% of the building's energy cost is associated with the air distribution in the space of an all-air solution. Anything that we do to reduce the total air volume into the space will translate into uh, real-world savings over the life of the building. Any questions so far? Here's some operating temperatures that we see for the entering chilled water. Obviously, for a 56 degree entering water temperature, the space is being designed to something like 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. Uh, in many cases, if we look at that, uh, it will preclude the use of an active beam for the space, uh, given the mass flow that would be required to offset the latent load. Somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 60 is, uh, is generally a good starting point for a space design of 75 and 55% relative humidity. And then, of course, in heating, overhead heating to ensure that we have proper air movement in the space. We need to uh, limit the discharge air temperature and generally that will mean that the supply water temperature to the beam for uh, heating application is likely going to be no more than 120 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for an 85 or so degree uh, supply air temperature. So beams don't have to be complicated. Again, these are just an element that's uh, in the designer's toolkit to be able to solve the uh, sensible loads of the space. Um, but they are a distributed piping system, and that does add labor, because the more pipe we hang, obviously the higher the costs. Uh, there are some things that will make life easier, of course, uh, and frankly deal with 
uh, the way that the building operates more effectively. And the next uh, few slides just show some of the weaknesses and strengths of uh, different piping configurations. Uh, generally, I suggest uh, considering, at the very least, a uh, pressure independent flow regulating device. And uh, these are available from several manufacturers, but it, it helps address uh, two issues. Uh, one of which, it ensures that the beam will receive at least the minimum flow rate that's required for uh, turbulent flow in the coil and proper operation. And secondly, it really minimizes the balancing effort that's required on the water side. Um, for comfort, if we decided to consider a beam for a four pipe application in the core, um, uh, that can create uh, a veritable nightmare in terms of uh, labor to hang all that pipe, although that's an available option to you as a designer. Um, in this particular instance, we're showing uh, a control valve that could be on each uh, connected beam, but for a system that is piped with uh, reverse return, conceivably we could solve that solution with one control valve for the zone, assuming all the, the beams that are in that space are the same length, and with a low-cost uh, ATC valve, uh, we could energize that zone uh, as necessary, and that beam array would uh, flow the adequate uh, GBM that we required for stable capacity or stable uh, operation. Uh, the alternative to that is, uh, is a flow regulating device on every beam. And the problem with a, a manual circuit setter for a large distributed piping system is simply that the, the building doesn't operate that way. Uh, the loads are not all going to be set at peak uh, at any given instant. And so the diversity of the building is such that if we balance the flow at uh, full design, uh, the building, which will operate at best uh, maybe 80% peak, uh, has the uh, potential to underflow and overflow other zones that need uh, turbulent flow and we're really designing closer to the bottom edge of what's required in terms of water flow to each beam and so having any uh, issue in terms of stable water flow uh, is a problem and so uh, it's really uh, pressure independent flow regulating devices on the water that really solves those problems. Uh, they're very low cost as well. Every beam needs to see the same chilled water temperature uh, cascading the chilled water complicates the selection process uh, exponentially. Um, and so effectively every, every beam needs to see the same supply of water temperature, uh, which as a, as a general rule for the design could be 60, 55. Modulating the water flow is, uh, is an issue because we're already at the lower limit of what uh, uh, we would distribute to a half inch tube. You can imagine that uh, a water control valve for a half a GPM or 0.65 GPM into a, a typical 2x4 coil is going to be a needle valve. Um, it's going to be prone to failure because any debris in the piping distribution system is going to get caught up in that needle valve and it'll be expensive. Modulating a half a GPM seems uh, reasonably senseless uh, for the benefit. <coughs> Why would we have glycol in the loop? The opportunity for airside free cooling with active beams is limited because we've cut the total air volume into the space uh, conceivably to half of what you would expect in an all air system. Uh, and so the, the solution then comes to us uh, by way of a water side free cooling. And that could be something creative like a, a coil installed on the inlet of a, uh, an air handling makeup unit, or makeup air handling unit, sorry, to scavenge heat from the building and effectively deliver it to the outside airstream uh, given that the energy has been paid for, uh, be it through either the occupants or the lighting load or the equipment. Uh, it's low grade energy, granted, uh, and if the, uh, the pumping calculations don't make sense for that to uh, be effective, it may not be an option. But generally, uh, decoupling the building loop from that secondary cooling opportunity on the water side is a, is a good strategy. Uh, glycol is expensive, for starters, and glycol through the beams uh, really impact the performance of the coil. Uh, particularly at low temperature. In heating, it's not an issue. But uh, due to the both the cost of coil, the, the cost of glycol, and uh, the impact to its performance of the active beam, glycol is generally not recommended to be circulated to the beams themselves. You're, you'll need that in the coil that creates your free uh, chilled water, or your water side free cooling, sorry. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, glycol through the beams is a bad idea. Uh, pressure independent flow regulating devices and then of course uh, because we have a large distributed piping system uh, the 
general consensus is to uh, uh, consider air vents uh, liberally, apply them liberally. Uh, it's difficult to get the air out of the system, and if the, uh, the air vents are installed at the beginning, it uh, helps create a, a much easier solution to be able to uh, purge any air locks, um, but definitely worth considering adding to the piping solution. So we've dealt with a 100% uh, latent capacity uh, by increasing the, the grains of separation or the humidity ratio between the primary air and the room design condition, or by increasing the, uh, the airflow rate. <clears throat> Some of the sensible cooling, of course, will come from that additional primary air. But uh, the water side is also, a, uh, through utopia at least, the ultimate uh, opportunity for cooling in the space. The more we can put onto the coil, obviously, the greater the, the energy return. And the total capacity of the beam is the sum of its parts, uh, being both the air side capacity and the water side capacity of the coil within it. The net benefit to the selection process is such that increasing the air side consumption yields greater overall capacity than increasing the flow rate. So doubling the water flow rate in the beam may yield 10 to 15 percent more capacity where earlier we discovered that doubling the pressure, not necessarily the volume, but doubling the pressure in the beam uh, could conceivably increase the capacity by 70%. Uh, and these are typical uh, capacities capable of being 250 to 1500 BTUs per linear foot. Um, this discussion effectively uh, centers around uh, proven performance or tested performance. Uh, the European standard is EN 15116. Uh, this is the calorimeter chamber that measures the thermal capacity of the beams. The more recent standard, which was uh, developed through ASHRAE and AHRI, is uh, special, through the Special Project Committee, SBC 200, uh, which is out for public review and may be issued uh, shortly, if it's not out already, actually. Uh, but when bedding manufacturers uh, again, beams are sheet metal boxes with coils in them. Ensure that this standard is adhered to, uh, to uh, be confident that the capacity can be achieved uh, through each of those uh, pieces of equipment. <clears throat> so to recap, the active beams as a decoupled ventilation system are lowering our overall fan energy. Uh, we have the benefit of smaller ductwork, although I oftentimes encourage consultants to consider upsizing that ductwork slightly. And the reason for that is churn in the space effectively. If we agree that we've cut the air handling system in half uh, when compared to an all-air system, uh, sizing the air handling unit for something, say, at 400 feet per minute instead of 500 feet per minute, uh, intrinsically builds in an opportunity for scalability to the, to the design. Uh, it improves the, uh, the cycle time between filter changeouts, and incrementally it's maybe a box size on a compartmental unit or some. Uh, pre-packaged piece of equipment, it's it's not a huge premium to pay for that peace of mind and ultimately that opportunity to be able to repurpose the space uh, given that uh, nearly every building will see that. Uh, great for retrofit applications, again, very tight spaces. Beams oftentimes are installed in ceilings that can be less than 12 inches uh, in terms of uh, bottom of the ceiling to under slab of the uh, floor above. Uh, and, and frankly, very affordable. Uh, beams today are uh, running neck and neck in terms of <coughs> installed costs, installed costs with uh, a conventional fan coil system. Uh, there are exceptions to that, of course, in terms of uh, controls. The more elaborate the controls, obviously, the, the larger the cost, and the more control resolution that's required on the space can also uh, obviously drive up the installed cost. Uh, but a very uh, attractive option for institutional-based applications given that uh, the district cooling is often uh, in situ, it's on, the, uh, it's on the site to begin with. Um, also, large district campus cooling applications also struggle with uh, low delta D syndrome and low quality chilled water supply, uh, where the beams are taking much warmer, sorry, much warmer chilled water to them. Uh, and frankly, they can't use the cooler water because it will condense. Uh, also helps to improve the delta T across the chiller plant and improve the operating uh, performance of that uh, uh, district cooling application. And so uh, really for uh, post-secondary education and large 
the larger the system, obviously, as an applied system, uh, the greater the benefit, frankly. Uh, the other benefit as well is the individual zone capability, zoning capability. So for the cost of a two-position uh, control valve and a thermostat, uh, we can achieve some lead credits relative to individual room temperature control. Uh, again, a, a big, large benefit. Uh, they've been coupled to geothermal heat pumps, where uh, they've been used as a water-to-water -water heat pump, and uh, uh, on their piping array used for uh, load shifting. So they'll be cooling in the core and heating the part of the perimeter in the off-peak season. And through the, in the mechanical room, those water streams can be effectively managed to shift the loads uh, from the heat of rejection on the, uh, on the water loop to the perimeter where it's needed. Waterside free cooling may be an option, and the only reason I say that in this, uh, in this application or in this uh, slide is it may turn out that waterside free cooling is not attractive. Uh, we can't uh, solve it with the simple foil on the outside air handling unit, maybe we need a fluid cooler. Uh, if it's a larger system, a closed circuit fluid cooler can also be attractive. Uh, the selection of those becomes quite critical in the fact that uh, the conventional off-the-shelf uh, cooling tower may not be uh, effective at generating the secondary chilled water that we want. Oftentimes you'll want to see those uh, coils thinned, and thin applications uh, generally have to come from the factory for that. And uh, the manufacturers that make those cooling towers uh, offer that service. Uh, but uh, that's a consideration, particularly for our climate uh, and in the wintertime, in the shoulder seasons, that uh, thinned to on the closed circuit fluid curve, or closed circuit cooling tower, sorry, uh, can really extend the range for the dollars that are spent on that cooling tower device. Uh, we talked about this, uh, the increased comfort. Because of the close approach temperature to the space, uh, and the vigorous mixing of the primary air, which is low temp relative to the space as well, uh, and then for lead compliance, very quick response time, we're swapping out the air in the space at uh, high induction ratios. Uh, let's say we're delivering 100 CFM to a beam, that's 600 CFM of air delivered to the space, turning its volume, and uh, low to reasonable acoustics, again, following the guidelines of lower pressure and smaller nozzles. And that, that also becomes a talking point in terms of the selection. Again, the beams are a sheet metal box with oil in it. If we have an application and we have a deliverable by the client whereby that space needs to be quiet and these spaces are adding logarithmically to the acoustic content of the room, it's important to understand where that spectrum is at issue and address it. And so um, it's been observed on other projects whereby a competitor came and offered a, uh, a shorter coil uh, because the capacity of the beam was suitable to accomplish that. But the design criteria of the space was such that the acoustic content was driving the length of the beam. And an eight foot beam was actually required with smaller nozzles to deliver the spectral content for the acoustic engineer to solve the acoustics in the space given that it was a recording studio and a performing arts school. Uh, so this value engineering attempt which conceivably could do the job with a four foot coil that wasn't the issue. It was understanding that that uh, piece of equipment was selected specifically to address not just the thermal comforts of the space, but also the air distribution in the room to limit the air velocities, as well as deal with the acoustic content and the, uh, the radiant asymmetry of the glazing that was chosen for the space. That's really what drove the selection. And as consultants, uh, those are a part of the solutions uh, for which you apply your craft to ensure that the space is uh, is comfort, sorry, controlled comfortably, and and deals with uh, all of the elements that have been defined in the discussion that uh, typically uh, is held with the architect and uh, conceivably even better yet the owner, uh, because if you understand what it is that is expected to the space relative to churn, relative to acoustics, uh, a, a more tailored solution can be brought to uh, to bear. And so that obviously has the, cost, the potential for higher first costs. Uh, but those, those decisions were made knowing that uh, it wasn't a, a drop-in solution to deliver X number of ETUs. All of the elements were a weighted basket to, deliver, to provide the deliverable to, uh, uh, to the end user. Uh, there is increased uh, pump energy, obviously, and the, the real uh, crux or the real opportunity for escalation in terms of costs come from uh, piping costs for, say, a four-pipe solution in the core, where conceivably some more uh, innovative opportunities relative to piping and airside temperature control uh, could be considered that may dramatically reduce the amount of pipe that needs to be hung to achieve that comfort level. Uh, 
potentially a, a duct mounted booster coil uh, at the perimeter to reset the primary air in the winter season without spoiling the cooling capacity in the core as a staged heating element uh, so that we have a little bit of uh, extra heat at the uh, perimeter where we'll lose it most obviously. But we do have limited air side free cooling, that's a given. And we deal with that on the water side. We do have limited VAV modulation range, although <coughs> VAV in terms of being used as a terminal occupancy control device is a great solution and helps us address the risk of overcooling. Uh, a space that's unoccupied for which the primary air is representative of a high portion of the total sensible cooling. Uh, humidity control is paramount. Um, it's not an issue if we understand the loads in the space and the construction of the envelope. It is a talking point relative to the design team to ensure that <coughs> the envelope can support uh, low total air flows into the space. Uh, perhaps uh, in the beginning for construction that could be suspect, a discussion relative to an air door test for the space to ensure that the building is properly sealed and that the infiltration loads are under control uh, could be a talking point. There's a cost to that, obviously. Uh, as the construction standard reaches a certain minimum that for which, as a design team, you are comfortable to consider, uh, obviously that would uh, fade into the background in terms of being a prerequisite. But in the beginning, uh, that may be a talking point if we see that uh, conceivably there's a real risk there uh, and there's a cost to it. And it may require a building envelope upgrade. This becomes particularly a good talking point in retrofit applications, historical buildings that have leaky envelopes. Um, the the beginning discussion may start with something like, we'd like to offer this as a solution, but the building envelope itself is a problem, and uh, it allows us to open the door for that talking element, uh, given that, frankly, lowering the overall loads is in everybody's best interest, including the owner. Uh, uh, but it could be conceivably a, either a, a, a good uh, beginning discussion or the end of the discussion relative to the couple ventilation systems for the space. <clears throat> we may need more sophisticated controls for humidity control. Conceivably, at every zone, uh, we would want to have some level of feedback to ensure that the space hasn't uh, fallen out of design, or that if it has, we've had some means to respond to that, uh, be it turn off the, uh, the chilled water to the, the zone completely, Excuse me. or uh, uh, reset the zone in the event that it's a larger application. And so these are some of the uh, some of the spaces that we might consider for active beams. Uh, office spaces, data centers. Now, data centers in this context is really more of a, a desktop farm as opposed to a rack room, uh, which obviously is its own uh, uh, has its own design criteria and there's specialized equipment for that. Uh, retail spaces again, uh, it can be uh, a little more difficult to uh, to consider those spaces, not being able to predict the uh, the loading in the space. Uh, and labs for institutional, I'll, I'll pre-qualify that as dry labs. Okay, so wet labs that are driven by code air changes are uh, pretty much off the table in terms of active beams for the space. Uh, but dry labs are uh, have been done, uh, several of them. Lecture theaters, schools, hospitals are off the table in Canada, according to CSA. Uh, in the U.S., uh, ASHRAE is, uh, and the, uh, the authorities that have per permit that are using uh, active beams in class two spaces. Here in Canada, it's, it's not going to happen for years, if at all. Uh, but currently, they're out. Uh, child care facilities, etc. And, and again, they're not for they're not for every space. Kitchens and, and uh, washrooms and so on are, are uh, for obvious reasons, not to consider uh, active beams. Uh, but as a general guideline, the, the load calcs and the accounting that we do uh, for each space allows us to make the decision as to whether or not an active beam is suitable for that environment. Um, some gratuitous application shots. Um, this is a typical T-bar ceiling with the integration of the lighting solution. Uh, this is an application whereby the beam is hidden behind a, uh, a wood slat ceiling and the application becomes relevant in terms of its uh, positioning. Uh, if you can see it in the picture, it's actually been painted black and is mounted behind the wood slat ceiling here. So in this particular setup, it's critical that the beam is placed adequately from the back side of the wooden slat ceiling to allow the natural convective currents to make their way through the wood slat ceiling. And then, of course, the discharge from the beam uh, needs to be uh, uh, discharged onto a piece of sheet metal that's known as a coanda wing. 
and a coanda wing is a, ex essentially just an extension to the surface of the linear slot. And uh, because of the way that beams are fabricated, there's a bit of a, uh, a change in profile at the discharge of the, of the beam itself. And that's used to create a low pressure zone, which uh, creates or introduces coanda, uh, which just ensures that the discharge of the air clings to the ceiling and is properly distributed or thrown into the space. And uh, for all beam manufacturers, that's required uh, to be about six inches beyond the discharge slot. And so for free hung beams, uh, a coanda wing or some extension is a, is a necessary evil. And generally that adds overall uh, roughly about a foot of width to the, to the active beam. So in this application, that beam would be three feet wide and uh, mounted about uh, 12 inches from the backside of that uh, opening open wooden slot ceiling, wooden slat ceiling. And then the discharge path becomes important as well relative to ducts not being mounted uh, in the way and creating a downdraft current into the room. Oops, sorry. <coughs> On a boardroom or a little meeting room, uh, the configuration of the lights in this instance was crosswise to the discharge of the beam. That was done intentionally to ensure that uh, uh, the air passed across the thin cable that hung down from the ceiling. Uh, also seen these installed where the lights extend beyond the beam, directly underneath of it. And so the beam becomes a, a local capture point for the sensible heat that flows off the back of the lighting fixture, uh, which is fine. It actually provides overall net more capacity, but it's not factored into the selection process. Uh, this is a childcare facility whereby the coanda surface was <coughs> created by a bulkhead. Uh, in a one-third, two-third split, and that T-bar ceiling uh, is just extended beyond either side to hide the ductwork and the piping uh, into the space and create, in this case, two feet on either side, which is fine. Uh, this particular installation also had a, uh, a radiant heated slab, so it was a very elaborate uh, mechanical solution for uh, pretty indiscriminate tenants. <laughs> Uh, this application has beams that are mounted much closer than you would normally see discharge of beams. It's providing a tremendous amount of capacity. It's uh, affixed with the Kawanda wings. So you can see them on either side. And the reason whereby these beams could be placed so closely to one another, uh, even though they're colliding airstreams would most uh, surely create a uh, downward draft, is the fact that they're mounted so high. And so if you look at the bottom of the frame of the photo here, you can see that the heads of the uh, of the uh, patrons of this uh, coffee barista and uh, because of the height the uh, colliding airstreams would uh, feather out and fan down to the occupied space without creating a, an uncomfortable draft while yielding a tremendous sensible cooling capacity. That's it. Thank you for your patience. Are there any uh, questions for Derek? There must be yes. Go ahead. Um, where do you recommend to put the zoom uh, um, sensor on the choking or on the, on the choke water pipe? Or okay, so the, the question was uh, is there a recommendation relative to the positioning of the dew point sensor, uh, be it either at the chill beam or on the chilled water supply? Uh, ultimately, my preference is to have the dew point detection at the face of the coil, uh, about in the center of the beam. That being said, there aren't many manufacturers that offer a, a dew point detection system that can be integrated easily, given that the controls contract is typically separated from the mechanical supply. And so if the manufacturer doesn't offer that as a, as a piece of equipment that's supplied, or if it's a, a piece of equipment that doesn't mesh or play nicely with the uh, controls uh, contract of the successful on the job, oftentimes a more uh, practical solution uh, includes a combination T-STAT, which maybe has a, uh, a relative humidity detection and a dry bulb for a prediction of the dew point. Uh, dew point detection directly on the chilled water is also uh, adequate and suitable. Um, from a personal uh, point of view, it's, uh, it's last to see the space, uh, given that we're looking at the, the return air uh, conditions, and the return air path may not include a path over the dew point sensor, so the response time may not be appropriate, so I generally favor dew point detection in the space, be it through a combination stat or in Utopia, uh, some detection directly at one of the lead zone beams. 
uh, and that typically would be driven by a beam that uh, conceivably would be mounted near the perimeter. Uh, ultimately, we're going to lose the dew point in the space with operable windows. Uh, no operable windows is better, but uh, operable windows for beam compliance is generally a prerequisite. Uh, so just uh, ensuring that we have that detection or coupling the, uh, 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 the sensor uh, to the control strategy at that location because the thermostat's probably not going to be mounted on the outside wall either uh, is the goal. And so uh, maybe several uh, sensors or de uh, detection points are required to get stable control, but oftentimes I would say you would see it in the uh, combination staff. You have answered my question, which is where the thermostat is kind of going to go, but okay. what are you driving with that thermostat? What would you prefer to drive? The valve? The water valve, the water valve principally. So the, the primary air is needed for uh, a minimum vent for ventilation, of course, for the space, unless it's a, a space where we're isolating the primary air flow because of occupancy and the risk of overcooling, like a, a meeting room where the primary air is a higher percentage. Uh, but fundamentally, it would be water. Uh, air side would be second. Uh, it could be a two stage stat uh, as well. So primary air is stage one. Uh, if we don't have a, a condition of the uh, Loss of dew point in the space, then the chill water can come out at stage two. Uh, it doesn't have to be that elaborate. Again, it can be much simpler. It comes in as a thermostat is preset, it operates as a constant volume system. Like, what's your experience amongst the arch architectural community? Is, is the word out there amongst architects that this technology exists? Uh, Just generally. Yeah. Um, generally, yes. They understand that they exist. Um, they've been embraced at different levels of acceptance. Uh, some find them repulsive and don't want to have them in their space at all. Uh, but that generally is the minority. Generally, architects uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to bring a value to their clients to say, I can guarantee that your space will consume less overall fan energy if you consider this system. And it's on par in terms of in first installation costs uh, to and maybe they've already done the work in advance to say this building will save 30 percent compared to the conventional system that we were considering for that particular space and if they have those answers and they're armed with those answers in advance they're genuinely bringing value to their client and for the clients for which they are receiving repeat business that's appreciated by the client uh, if, it, if it's no premium in terms of cost and it yields a better overall uh, operating uh, condition and uh, let's say even maintenance, because I haven't touched on maintenance, and I, I should have. Um, they appreciate that. Uh, the beams themselves have coils that are uh, widely gapped at the fin. And because they're on the ceiling, they don't tend to load as quickly as uh, coils that would be mounted down low, say like baseboard or permanent or induction systems. And so oftentimes we, and, and we can't say it will be this long before that coil loads. But uh, the trend is generally, it's, it's very infrequently that we would need to service a beam relative to cleaning the coil. They will fin load uh, along its edge, uh, but that doesn't stop them from performing. What it does is it drives up the operating cost. Because of the restricted air path through the coil, uh, the system becomes less efficient. And so uh, maintaining those coils on a uh, semi-regular basis is in the best interest of the owner and the occupier. Uh, sorry, whoever's paying the bills, frankly, uh, because the system just works harder to maintain the, uh, the temperature in the space. The general rule of thumb or the guideline is typically for a new building, check it at six months, check it at a year, and then establish a cleaning frequency. Um, there are active beams I know that have been installed seven and eight years ago that have not seen service at all. There are other beams that I'm aware of that have buildings with uh, operable windows that uh, need regular service, principally because when the windows are open, the dust blows into the space and it's immediately drawn into the coil and loads it much more quickly than it would have in a space that was isolated from the outside. And so uh, from the perspective of costing no more, providing high comfort in the space and uh, uh, requiring very little ongoing maintenance, they're becoming more and more attractive for the spaces in which they're appropriate. And again, they're not for everywhere. Does that help? Yeah. That's my, that was my soap, soapbox speech. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Then uh, yeah, I'll wrap it up with that and uh, help me thank Darren for uh, his time. <laughs>
by presenting him with this token of our appreciation. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, a uh, couple last items to point out. Uh, just like in months past, there will be an email sent to everybody who registered that it, um, contains a link to a survey. So, please take the time to fill that out. The feedback is really valuable for planning next year. Also, note that if you register with several guests, so if one person from your company registers four or five people, it's only sent to the registrant. So, if you can pass that along to the other people that you may have registered, so they have the opportunity to reply as well, that's appreciated. Um, next month is our last meeting um, with the uh, past president's night. It should be a big turnout. The thing to remember is it's a week later than normal. Uh, every other month we have the third Tuesday of the month. This will be the fourth Tuesday of the month. There's a scheduling conflict with our venue. So uh, put that into your calendars. Try not to forget. It'll certainly be on the communique. And we'll be sending out a couple of mail shots as reminders, but this is your first warning. So uh, try and keep that in mind. Other than that, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you all in May. Good night.